She is a multimedia painter inspired by bright color and geometric form. Her unique creative process uh, involves up to 20 layers of painting and drawing on tissue applied to wood panel. She escaped careers in retail, civil service, and advertising to become an artist. And this is her 10th year as part of the Eastside Culture Crawl. Please give her a warm welcome. <laughs> for short people. <laughs> okay, I'm Marianne, and I would just like to say if my art career was a movie, the title would be It's Never Too Late. So what happened, my art career basically began with a really terrible event. My husband came home and he said, I've just been fired from my job. And I was a stay-at-home mom with two young kids and we were like, oh, what are we gonna do? But we decided to turn it around and maybe use it as, um, as kind of an opportunity. Uh, we rented out our house, took our daughter out of school, and we traveled for, well, we traveled for three months through Southeast Asia, and we lived in Japan for three months, and it was a fantastic experience, which I would recommend to anybody. But then, after we came back, like, you've had a life-changing experience, and you think, I don't want to go back and do the same thing. I want to pursue something different, and for me, it was something creative. So, I searched around, I did different things in sales and marketing, and I took courses in writing, but art was my passion. Like, if, when I did art, when I started to paint, it was something like, wow, I love this. I could do this and lose track of time. So, fast forward about uh, 10, I, I've been a full-time artist, as Rachel said, in the crawl for 10 years, and an artist for 10 years. So, um, my career's been going on pretty well. I've been in about 100 shows to date, about 10 solo shows, two-person shows, and financially for me, every year has been better than the last. Not to say that I'm making a lot of money, but just it's going up gradually. And it's artistically, it's been fantastic because I get to explore and do work that's unique to me. Uh, and as far as the art community, that's been wonderful too. That I've just met so many nice people and so many nice clients that uh, appreciate my work. So that's been great. So if you think that you too might like to become a later life artist, or maybe you're just a young artist already and you're thinking, oh no, I'm not going to achieve what I want to achieve, then I would just say, here are my tips for you. Okay, first of all, you have to have um, like a beginner's mind. So I wanted to become a really good artist, so I thought I'll have to go back to school. So I went late, and then as a mature student, I ended up in the degree program at Emily Carr. But I realized that I could learn not only from my instructors, but from the students, from everybody, and just be open to new ideas. For example, when I went in, I thought, hmm, I used to think that abstract painters were maybe <laughs> lazy or not talented and couldn't do <laughs> representational work. But then I had one fantastic um, inspirational instructor and now my work looks like this, completely abstract. So that was important. I think another thing as you're older is that you know yourself and uh, what you can do. So for me, uh, I paint really quickly. I'm kind of an impatient person. So did I skip two? There. Okay, so when I first got in the studio, I realized what I could do was I could basically knock off a painting a day, but I wasn't selling a painting a day, so you could see how that could go wrong. So what I do to slow myself down is, as Rachel mentioned, I paint in layers, so I, I'm on panel, I do a layer of tissue, and then I paint on top of that. So sometimes it's uh, representational, sometimes it's like a pattern, and then when I've got about um, 15 to 20 layers done, I start to tear it back. And that's another thing that I enjoy. I love peeling things like wallpaper, sunburnt skin, nail polish, whatever. <laughs> so, like. <laughs> so, like, you're just being in the studio and you're doing things, and the process comes out of that that's something unique to you because you love to do it. So, that's what's happening with that work that I'm going. And it's pretty obvious that I like bright color. So a lot of the work is in color. And the other thing you bring, I think, as a later life artist is that you bring um, your experiences. So lots of times, even though you can't tell, I've been working on a theme, I've been exploring issues, uh, lots of times around memory or ideas and things like that, and every layer. Uh, 
reflects that, but when you get to the final piece, you can't really tell, but that's okay, because I sort of feel like there's meaning underneath that and in the historic uh, process of the work. And I guess the other thing, the advantage for me, I guess financially, maybe I'm a little more established. So I got a studio in the Murgatroyd building, and that was fantastic. Tonight you'll be hearing from Christina and Jacqueline, two other great artists. It's a great building, supportive community. I was lucky enough to share a studio with Cheryl Forte, who's an artist. She totally inspired me by just showing me that you have to go in, you have to work 40 hours a week, like you're painting, you're marketing, but it's not like this vision like, oh, I'm an artist, like I'll just go in, I'll be inspired and it'll be really great. It's more like, no, you have to put in the hard work and do that. So that part, how am I doing? <laughs> Time to stop, okay. But I just wanna say that um, for me, it's been fantastic. I found uh, a job I love, it's the work I've done longer than any other job because I used to change about every three years. Um, I love my studio. There's such great pleasure in being there and I hope that you come and visit our building and maybe get creatively inspired there yourself. Thank you. So next up, we have Ross Denotter. Ross is a process artist born in Port Alberni, BC in 1969 and moving here to study photography in Ling at Langara College in 1990. <laughs> His works are a hybridization of traditional techniques. Stop making me laugh while I'm trying to introduce you. Traditional <laughs> techniques using primarily printmaking and photographic process, both in digital and analog. He is a photographer, uh, imaging technician, Goldsmith, as well as a teacher in the photography program at the Vancouver Institute of Media Arts. This is Ross's eighth year in the crawl. Please give Ross a warm welcome. Oh, there's lapsed time. No, don't worry about that. Just do okay. <laughs> I can see them on the screen too. I just have to turn and look. <laughs> I can go through the whole slideshow, can't I? No, don't do that. <laughs> I'm Ross. Um, Rachel gave me a chance to take five minutes of your life. <laughs> you guys bought tickets, right? So you bought tickets to listen to somebody who's sitting at the front who kind of feels like they might want to throw up a little bit. So I'm going to sell tickets on Granville Street on Friday night to a similar kind of event so you get because people kind of throw up there too um, so I'm uh, I'm a photographer primarily uh, most of my work starts with a camera um, some of some sort something a camera maybe I might make myself out of trash I don't make myself out of trash I make the camera out of trash um, and I work both digital analog and I don't have the patience to really paint. So everything that I, everything that I make winds up starting with uh, some sort of photographic image, some sort of something that was created with a camera because I don't really have the patience to uh, paint things. Except that. Then I painted that, kind of, but it, it's a transfer of a photo onto a panel with so it's not it's kind of a painting this isn't coming across right is it <laughs> no I'm a little nervous um, yeah I should have prepared for this more um, yeah I, I work in a bunch of different media I really kind of resisted the, the, the idea of arts I've been a photographer now for about 30 years and I, growing up, I, I, I did 
theater, I did dance, I did um, Charlotte and my wife's at the back and she's kind of probably going like this. Um, and sometimes she will bring me out to do party tricks, back spins, that kind of stuff. I don't do that anymore because I put my back out. Um, this is not going well. How's the time? <laughs> I kind of work in, there's no theme, there's no rhyme, there's no reason. I don't know if anyone kind of noticed that the five images really don't relate to the next set of images. And, and it's kind of weird because I wind up teaching a particular process. Now, I, I work as a, a, an artist, a photographer, I, I, I teach, and I really get a, a I really, really enjoy teaching. And I was joking, with, and I wasn't actually joking, it was entirely serious. I have uh, the, the department head of the school that I teach at, um, we were talking about uh, style development and how I will never, ever, ever teach that because the five photos that I've got here have absolutely nothing to do with the previous photos. They're all completely different. All the images wind up different. And I wind up creating work that's, that's in a particular series, and then I get really bored. And then I find a new process to work with. So I, as far as art, I think I'm a process artist in that I, I find a process, I try to figure out how to make it work, and then I move on to another process. And the, the body of work, I was trying to think of what the theme might actually be if I were to put a thread from one piece to the next, and the theme is actually change. I mean, all the, all the, all the photos, all the pieces, everything seems to be uh, bound together by this one constant thread of change, which is the only constant, really. The change is the only constant. So we've got this dandelion. The dandelion is a stage of a plant, and it changes into another stage of a plant. You wind up with dandelion seeds, then you've got 100,000 dandelions all over your backyard. They're nasty. They're tasty, but nasty. I'm not really sure how much of a change there is in this one, except it was a panel and I turned it into something else. So I'm going to skip that. But this one, I was working on a series of photos uh, of Maine and Hastings Street, and that was the sound that... Uh, I can keep going because I just kind of figured this out. Okay. Um, so, sorry. Um, two more. I knew it was two. That's great. So... I was working on a series of photos of Main Street and Hastings Street, called the series Main and Hastings. I took a photo of 900 Hastings, and then I took three more photos because something bad happened at 900 Hastings, and two people died, um, ultimately, in, in that um, fourth image. Well, not in that fourth image, but that represents the memorial of the uh, two people there at the bottom there, this little memorial there. So a lot of my work winds up representing some element of change. Um, from the Maine and Hastings series, I spun off another project where I started buying vintage cameras from uh, Value Village and, and Salvation Army. So I'm buying secondhand cameras, I'm using expired film, and I'm photographing buildings that have development permit signs in front of them. So the series is all about, uh, the series is about change, the buildings are undergoing change, the cameras have been dis essentially discarded by their previous owner, the film's expired, uh, the whole process is about change and end of use and that sort of thing. Uh, and then the fourth photo, which is kind of weird, I do silver and goldsmithing as well, um, and I was thinking, how does that represent change? Well, the piece that I wind up ultimately finishing is one that starts out as wax. So I make something in wax, I put it into plaster, melt metal, put the metal in the plaster, and then I come up with a, a ring that's a different material than what I actually started with. So really, I think I'm a, a, just a, a vessel for uh, change. Let's change the speaker. <laughs> so our next speaker is Jacqueline Robbins. She makes illustrated functional ceramics. In 1997, at the completion of a production pottery apprenticeship on Salt Spring Island, she moved back to Vancouver and joined what was then called the Glass Onion Studio and set up her practice. This same year, a handful of neighboring studios had a collective open house. Soon to follow was the birth of the Culture Crawl, 19 years ago. And she has actually participated with um, in the crawl since the beginning. So please welcome Jacqueline. Yeah, 
this. One of the originals. Okay, since you are my captive audience, I actually have questions for you. In a way. Oh, oh okay, well, yeah. okay, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh. No, no, it's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> oh, I see. Collaborative. That's good. Okay. 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 Since I've been here since the beginning, 18 years, 19, give or take, I have a few questions for you. I'll answer my questions and then I want you answered back. I've decided since I've been here 18 years to respond to the 18 most popular questions that I've been asked over the 18 years. So could you um, read this? What's, What's up, up with, with the crows? crows? What's up with the crows? Like almost everybody has crows in their work. Okay. Oh, Chi Chi in the back, right, right, right. Okay, so yes, crows are a popular event or I, I can all, uh, I've been doing this a long time and I'm still nervous. Okay, so everyone either has a story about the crows or is an extreme love or hated them. Like cilantro. <laughs> okay, it's true, right? Do you make this yourself? <laughs> Well, I do and do not. I have many influences, but this is my special studio assistant. His name is Sailor, and he's been with me 10 years, and he lets me know when it's time for a break. Other than that, yes, I've been making my work by myself. Why does this cost so much? <laughs> Well, I live in a first world country, and from the start to finish, I live here in the Vancouver, and nothing is outsourced in other countries. Okay. How long have you been doing this? <laughs> That's a hard task, or a hard number to achieve, since I've been working with Play-Doh, since my mother could achieve it, and it was very tasty, so... You know, you'd assume some. <clears throat> 20 years I've been making and beginning and ending and trying and failing and succeeding, succeeding at working with clay. How long does it take to make this? So depending on what you're working with, of course, Everything is a different amount of time, and you can't make one thing when it comes to ceramics. You have to fill a whole kiln worth. But just an example, uh, mugs take 90 minutes before you glaze it, before you fire it. And it's 19 hours when you fire it. So, How do you get the images on? <laughs> I love printmaking, and since I've learned how to print make, I've put images on in various methods, but I print onto paper and transfer onto clay, or transfer directly with um, poly polymer and wood and various different methods of impressing into the clay and then press it until it I do my notes here <laughs> until I can make it into its shape and then it transfers. What is, what this, is this made, made of? <laughs> the mid -tem temperature clay comes from Alberta. It's under under glaze California oh no. I know, right? Uh, <clears throat> the clay is made in Alberta. It, the raw materials come from uh, many different places, but it's made in Alberta. 
the under glaze comes from California and I put it on and I make the glaze. Is this breakable? Yes. <laughs> if you try hard enough. What do you use this for? This is where I ask for your suggestions. I'm just like, somebody would tap on the side of a bowl or a mug. I'm just like, I don't know, what do you want it to use for? Like, what would you use it for? Marshmallows. Oh, that's good. That's good. Like, anybody else? Hot curry. Oh, that's good. See? Culture crawl is coming up. I want to know. Where did you learn to do this? <laughs> So I was lucky enough to come, oh, see, you're good. <clears throat> there was a technician at Emily Carr that showed me how to throw, even though I was left-handed, in her own time. And so I learned how to throw from her. In that time, a long time ago, that was very rare. You had to be right-handed. And beyond that, I learned from a production pottery studio on South Spring Island. And Vanessa Hall Patch, who's in the audience here, taught me how to silk string onto clay. And I've taken it from there. Okay. Why do you put train tracks and old buildings on pottery? Why wouldn't you? I mean, it's pretty awesome. We live in this neighborhood, and people who don't live in this neighborhood, I mean, why wouldn't you? How much is your studio rent? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty reasonable considering <clears throat> I pay insurance and personal insurance and lots of other insurance and exciting news to present. And I am in the best studio ever, right? The Murgatroyd. Mm -hmm. So everybody come to the Murgatroyd. It's awesome. Do you do this full time? No. I have a grown-up job. <laughs> I work at Emily Carr. But it's a hard go, man. It's a hard go making an, uh, your living as an artist. Why do you make these shapes? <laughs> you know, I've tried a lot of different shapes, and these ones make the most sense. Uh, whether it's keeping the heat in or the cold in, how it, you know, feels on your lips, or the weight in your hand. I've worked hard on it. Where do your images come from? <clears throat> I take images from... Uh, the Vancouver Archives, my own photographs, drawings, and I have to admit, I walk along the streets at night and look into people's windows, and it's very intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have this in blue? No. 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 <laughs> I love custom work. Like I said, I like to w lurk into people's windows when they're not looking, but when they invite you to look in their windows when they're not looking, it's even better. Why do you do the crawl? Okay, so Marcella Dussamp said, the viewers complete the artwork. Most makers in isolations, we spend a great deal of time making decisions and creating things without external influences. When a piece, is, piece of art goes into the art gallery, the end of the story is the artist. <laughs> okay, bottom line is people come back and they talk to you and they respond instantly with your art. And it's such a good feeling. Right? It's instant, and you know they're the right people. You know, even if you do other fairs all throughout the year, it's like the crawl is like, it's, it's they're your people. So, 
this is my 18th year and I'll never stop doing it. So even if it's four nights a year, it's just like, oh, oh my God, why don't I know you already? <laughs> like, you probably live down the street and I don't know you. Yeah, I love the crawl. That's it. <laughs> Next up is Simone Richmond. Simone is a graduate of the Vancouver Community College Jewelry Art and Design Program. In 2013, she co-founded the Collaborative Art Jewelry Group, uh, Jewelry and, and Artists in Collaboration. Lace and textiles inform much of her work, which she often explores through an electro etching process and stitching with wire. This is her ninth year participating in the culture crawl. Please welcome Simone. Up the whole slide show. Is it the the this key or the up key? Yes, thanks. Okay. Okay. I know I'm gonna sit down. That's weird. Okay. Hi. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so this first slide is an image taken from a performance of Medea in 2013 by the Yayoi uh, Theater Movement Group. Um, if you're not familiar with Medea, it's a Greek tragedy, and this version, stay true to that, with a uh, cheating spouse, a murderous wife, and a not-so-happy ending. Um, this is the main character, Medea, and she's wearing a neck piece that I co-collaborated and created uh, with two other jewelry artists. And um, so, yeah, tonight I thought I would just talk about this project and my experience with that. Um, so this is the Medea piece um, close up, well, close or up. Um, so I did all of the etching work. Um, Patsy Kolasar and Sue Foster were my co-collaborators. Patsy did the really colorful enamel work, and Sue Foster did the really detailed filigree. Um, yeah, sorry. I really don't do this very often. Um, so, oh, and so how this project came to be um, was that we had, this is our second collaboration that we did together. So previously we made a neck piece for a mezzo-soprano to wear at Visual Space Gallery. Um, and so from there we met the gallery owner, uh, Yukiko Onli, and she introduced us to Yayoi Hirano, who was the theater group director. Um, and so she knew what we had been doing and she thought we'd be a good fit for what they were looking for. Um, this is the back of the piece. Um, so it's etched and then we pierced out some sections. Uh, we wanted the back to be as beautiful as the front because the, the performance was done in the Japanese no style. So it included a lot of handmade, really beautiful detailed costumes and um, hand carved masks for the actors to wear. So we, we wanted the Medea piece to be, to fit with that. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, tried to memorize it. <laughs> uh, what else? Thanks. I'm just trying to think what else I was going to say. Um, oh, yeah. So, and then, so, oh, right, okay. So then, sorry, how, how the whole, I talked about how the project came to be. And then, so when we decided that we would be a good fit. We met with Yayoi, the theater group director, and she showed us some of the costumes and her hand-carved masks, and um, she performed a little bit for us as well so we could get a feel for what the show would be like. And so from there, the three of us went our separate ways and came back and you know, did some research, had wine at the art galleries, shared sketches, um, that sort of thing to come up with a proposal to give to them. So we ended up um, giving them three pieces uh, to choose from. We ended up making all three of them and then they used two of them in the show. Um, this is the second piece that they used. It's the princess necklace. Um, so again, there's the detailed filigree inside the swirly tails, um, the enamel and the etching. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, sorry, um, 
I don't remember what I was going to say next, I don't think. Um, anyway, so I wanted to share with you my experience with the whole collaborative process. Um, I, when Patsy first came to me, she's my studio mate, and my spouse refers to her as my creative partner in crime because she's always coming to me with these ideas and I'm always like oh that sounds good but I don't know if I want to do it right away and then I do it and it's like the best thing ever so we she came to me at first and I had a lot of questions I wasn't sure in my head like oh well maybe my I didn't know if my work would be up to par with her and Sue's I wondered you know would it turn into like a really bad grade school project group project where someone you know someone's doing all the work and that kind of thing. Um, that totally didn't happen because I know both, both of them very well. So, um, and then what ended up happening I found was that it really opened up my creative energy and I was able to be part of um, the creation of these pieces that I definitely wouldn't have ever done on my own. Um, and they got to be in, you know, a beautiful performance for people to see. Um, in 2014, I think, the following year, the Medea piece, we were able to get it um, into a show in Switzerland. So that was a really big accomplishment for all of us to have that um, go internationally. So yeah, I would just say that if you have the opportunity to collaborate and you're not sure about it, sit with that and then just do it because it's amazing and it's fun. And if you're doing it with your people, then it, it can't go wrong. So yeah. Thanks. Next up is Ben Zed Cooper. Ben is an extremely handsome and hilarious individual who I admire very much. And that's what he wrote in the email to me in their bio. So I thought I'd read it out because it's awesome. But the real bio is... Ben Cooper's work is often influenced by the concept of time and humanity's impact on the world. He often uses a wide variety of media from recycled materials and photography to projection mapping onto buildings. Ben's business, H4 Studios, a new media design studio that specializes in interactive art experiences. This is his third year participating in the crawl. Please welcome Ben Zed Cooper. I really didn't expect her to read that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm also supposed to explain why I call myself an imaginographer. Uh, I, s I, what? Oh, and I advanced my slide. Um, so that's, that's something an imaginographer does. Uh, I always had a trouble with the word artist because I was never really sure what an artist was. You know, it can be so many different things. Uh, I think the best answer I ever found for that was uh, on a little on a little post-it somewhere and it just said art is toast with jam and that really just sums it up for me it can be anything <laughs> uh, there's no limits and so I call myself an imaginographer because I came from I started in uh, photography then I went into cinematography that's where my love of lenses comes from and then you know I've always liked making stuff assembling stuff with mixed media uh, I love, you know, playing with maps, uh, I do events, uh, like immersive experience events, and uh, projection mapping and all sorts of stuff. Like, what, what do you call that? I have no idea. An imaginographer. That's the answer. Um, this is one thing that uh, my business does, H4. We do, uh, this is for the Vancouver Cherry Blossom Festival. We collaborate with some uh, dancers and uh, project on the trees when they're in full bloom and do uh, a performance and then sort of an immersive experience um, where you can walk around in the trees. And all of that is projections and then the, these lamps react to um, the projections that are going on. So it's really cool. Check it out in the spring. We kind of announce it with somewhat short notice because we don't know when the cherry blossoms are going to blossom. We can't schedule that. Um, so uh, very similar to Simone, um, you know, when I, I came from a film background and all projects are collaborative projects. There are very few solo projects. And so very early on in my life, uh, I came to this realization that, you know, we need to collaborate to create anything non-trivial. And uh, recently I actually found a word for that, another new word for your vocabulary tonight, uh, senius. It's um, 
the musician and artist uh, Brian Eno came up with this word uh, to define uh, a creative and uh, a certain type of creative because there is no like lone genius. There's like even Da Vinci was like, oh, he was he was brilliant. He just stayed in his studio and made amazing things. No, he actually had a lot of people supporting him. He had rich people giving him money. He had um, you know other people encouraging his work, showing his work. Um, you know, we need cat wranglers like Rachel to bring all us artists together to talk to people like you. We need curators like uh, curators like Chris Benson to. Uh, have spaces like this. We need a community around us. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter what you're making. Nobody's going to see it. So, um, this is something I made uh, with my business partner. They're called Divine Lights. Uh, so we do a lot of projection mapping, and oh, it doesn't it doesn't loop. There you go. Um, so this is uh, this was inspired by wanting to bring projection mapping out into the world a little bit more and have it as an object that you can share because we do this projection mapping and it's a lot of fun, but it's only there for one night or a couple of nights and then it's gone. You never see it again. So uh, inspired by uh, stained glass, we made um, made these pieces. You can check them out on the internets, divine, divinelights.org. Um, and so I, I think that's a big part of art for me is sharing experience, sharing inspiration, um, sharing an idea and uh, getting excited about something, you know, there, there's so many things out there these days that uh, we, we're, we're so immune to being amazed. Like I, I have one friend, he, as soon as a new phone comes out, he's like, well, yeah, I guess it's good, but the next one's coming out in like a year. So like, <laughs> yeah, they settle down. Anyway. Um, so I guess I'll share one more thing. This is another, we do a lot of uh, uh, brand stuff um, for with H4. Uh, we make events interesting and interactive. This is a bottle glorifier. This is a proximity sensor and which creates a whirlpool in this bottle. So when you put your hand up and down, it controls the, uh, controls the intensity of that whirlpool. And uh, when we pitched this project. We had no idea what we were doing. We, we, did, we I had never worked with proximity sensors in my life. Uh, I knew that there was these, there were these different things, and that we could put them together, and it would make something interesting. And uh, thankfully, thanks to a really good team around us, we were able to do that, which is great. Um, so I guess that that's a big part of my process is the. Uh, having lots of interesting things around me, whether it's like pictures or bookmarks on my computer um, or just interesting stuff in every single corner of my studio um, or interesting people around me. So thanks a lot for coming and let's chat sometime. Our next speaker is Renee McDonald. She is a bespoke Bespoke, I always say that wrong, sorry. Bespoke shoemaker. She took up the craft in 2008 and later worked in a shoe repair uh, to widen her base, uh, her base of knowledge. With the fundamentals of grace, comfort, and longevity core to her designs, Renee launched Westerly Handmade Shoes in 2012 when she ma where she makes shoes to order. This is her fourth year in the culture crawl. Please welcome Renee. Hi. Uh, so I wrote, I wrote everything down. <laughs> and I got really scared when I saw that intro shot, because I'm like, those are not the photos <laughs> I said. <laughs> but thankfully, these are the photos. Um, so yes, I make shoes to order. Uh, I might also be referred to as a bespoke shoemaker. And basically, this means that to take an order in, the first thing I do is have the client into my studio. Uh, I measure their feet, and we work out all the details of uh, what their new shoes are going to be like. Um, so the first image I'm showing here is of uh, the maple shoes. I'm just going to say the photo's a little um, um, not quite 
uh, it's a little bit warped. So the, the, uh, they look a little different in, in person. Um, because I was going to say, is there one, one of my favorite pairs right now? But they're a little bit different like this in, in real life. Um, in any case, um, I made these for a client who came to see me from San Francisco. Um, she needed a pair of shoes that were going to look really professional um, and still accommodate her orthotics. Um, at the time that she came, she only had one pair of shoes that fit in their running shoes. They were totally not doing what they needed uh, to do for her. Uh, so we made her one pair, and she got used to uh, when she once she got used to wearing something that really fit her style aesthetic and were comfortable. Um, she basically just ordered the second pair immediately, and these are them. Um, one thing I always need to try to explain to people is that uh, looking at a photo or even a pair of shoes on the shelf, um, if you're ordering a pair, they're not going to turn out looking the same way um, because uh, depending on the shape of your foot and color choices, what sort of sole you go with, um, everything uh, contributes to how they're going to look at the end. And so this pair of shoes is different from the ones that would wear on my feet and, and so on. And I was really happy with how these ones came along. Uh, oh, right, I'm in control here. Um, so, um, I thought it might be interesting to show you a little bit about the bespoke process. Um, so, starting from the top left there, um, I start by taking the measurements that I've taken, measurements and drawings that I've taken from the client's feet, uh, and I pair them up best I can to a pair of uh, lasts that I have in my collection. Um, the last is the form that the shoe is built on, and it's what dictates the size, uh, style, um, fit, heel height, and so on. Um, so in this image, you can see that I'm building it up to improve the width and a little bit on the length of the toe. Um, and then I shape it to fit. Um, uh, I, can, I can modify the length, width, depth, and so on um, by that method. In the top right, you can see where I'm uh, cutting patterns into the leather, and I've also started to shape the insole and the heel stiffeners. Bottom uh, left is uh, the shoes once they've been constructed, or just the uppers, rather, um, where some people say at this point it looks more like a hat than a shoe. Um, and then on the bottom right here is um, where I'm adding, I'm putting the upper onto the last. And uh, this is the process called lasting and it's when the, f when the boot starts to take the form of a boot. Uh, the next step would be to move on to soling and building the heels, trimming, finishing and so on. Um, probably hundreds of images um, I could show to illustrate the whole process, but I was hoping to at least give you an overview just to sort of see what the inside of a shoe looks like. Um, and if you want to see the uh, end result, I have a, um, a pair of this style that's in, on display on the back uh, in the gallery. And actually, the ones in the back are the first pair that I made for Westerly. And I realized that I still have them sitting on my shelf for display. Um, so that's what you can see in the back. Uh, so this is the imp design. Um, it's a start sort of a style evolution off of the boot that I was showing previously. Um, uh, and this is just a sort of a bit of a riff off of it. Uh, I've just taken the front um, forefoot seam sort of par partially across the forefoot to give it a little bit of a sort of asymmetry and strip the laces down. I've added an internal elastic panel, which you can't see. Um, but the idea with the panel is that that holds the foot in place when you're moving, walking and dancing, whatever. Um, and the idea was to try to keep the whole aesthetic of the shoe quite plain so that the um, main focal point, which is the wood uh, grain relief print, would, uh, would really show up. Um, so the wood grain relief um, print that's on this uh, shoe was done by Carrie Christensen, who is, oh wow, I'm talking so, um, who is my studio mate, and uh, she made it off of the wood round that you see on the top there, and um, the laser etching was done by Colin of Creative Mayhem. They're both in Parker, 1000 Parker, so you can visit them if you come see me. Um, I'll try to buzz through this one. Um, so this is the Main Street ankle boot done in two-tone leather. Um, this is just what the client chose for this particular pair. Um, they're a little bit more formal than the previous ones that I was showing, uh, more similar to the front, the first pair, the maple shoes. 
and uh, this shows the soling that I use, which typically is chosen for comfort, longevity, um, withstanding rainy streets of Vancouver and so on. Um, I'm a cyclist. Everything that I wear has to endure life on the streets, so to speak. And so everything that I do is made for um, repair and maintenance. Um, and finally, I thought I would finish off with an image of one of my custom design projects. Uh, this client actually brought me sketches of a boot uh, he had in his mind. He drew everything out, including even the stitching accents. Um, it took me a while to figure out how I was going to get that to work in leather, but in time I did, and I was, we were both happy with how it came out. Um, as I mentioned before, there are lots of reasons people come in to see me uh, for bespoke shoes. Um, Sometimes they're looking for something they can't find in a store, sometimes because they have real fitting problems. Um, and then there are those who, after my own heart, come in because they want a shoe they can wear, repair, and enjoy for many years. Um, by doing this, they're helping us to move away from a disposable world and back towards the type of consumerism where you get to know the makers who dress you. And to me, that's a really big part of uh, bespoke shoemaking. Um, so thanks for coming and for listening, and um, hopefully I'll get to see you at the crawl. Thanks. Next up, we have Christina Norberg. She uses surreal organic imagery to explore both external and internal landscapes as we move further into the technological future. She studied drawing, painting, and sculpture at the School of Contemporary Art at Simon Fraser University. In 2013, Christina had her first international exhibition in Bologna, Italy, and this is her ninth year taking part in the Culture Crawl. Please welcome Christina. How does that sound back there? Good? Okay. Hey, everybody. I'm already advanced. Okay, good. Oh, you can see it right here. Perfect. Okay, so I thought that I would begin with where my work begins, spending time in nature. For me, going for walks, hikes, uh, camping trips, uh, they're essential for me as an artist um, and as a person. Uh, it allows my, my spirit to be refueled, essentially, to be able to handle the pressure of this crazy modern society. In nature, I'm able to reconnect with myself. I'm sure most of you have had this experience before. It's pretty easy living here in Vancouver, so close to the mountains and the oceans. Um, I feel, you know, the forests are not only the lungs of our planet, but they are um, the key to our emotional health and our humanity. So on these walks, I have my camera with me constantly because inevitably there's some inspiration that jumps out at me. Um, I'm especially attracted to patterns, textures, fractals, and open spaces like oceans, lakes, and um, mountains, of course, that give me that sense of awe. So then uh, I get back into the studio and I want to bring that um, experience that of, of outer and inner um, into my work. So um, uh, I feel like the three-dimensional aspects of my work represent the outside of the body, the tangible, that environment-based aspect of nature. You can touch it, you can you know, feel it with your body, you, you exist physically in the space. Um, and then I combine that 3D with 2D mixed media painting. Um, 2D allows you to kind of look inward. Um, it, uh, it basically allows you to look more deeply into imagined, an, an imagined space, um, an intangible space like what we have inside ourselves. Um, so this is where I begin to explore my feelings, my intuitions um, as a human living in this time where we seem to be racing ever faster into um, a future that seems further and further from one that sustains us. So in these pieces, pieces I was focusing on using uh, sustainable materials. So I was using paper mache, wool, post-consumer magazines, cardboard, and clothing. Here is a series that I did working with the same kind of theme, um, examining where we are right now as humans. So I uh, used 40 reclaimed fire alarm bells uh, to be my painting surfaces, and this series is called Alarm Call. 
Uh, I thought the materials were rather poignant. And this is a series of work that I call Feltanicles, Felted Botanicals. Um, with these, I really wanted to explore the three-dimensional aspect of my work without getting distracted by the 2D. So these are needle-felted wool, and they're soft and touchable and accessible. And I wanted to um, uh, allow an experience where you're kind of feeling maybe connected or, or having a relationship with nature, but you can bring it into your home and cuddle it. So here at the crawl this year, you'll see some feltanicals, but you're mostly going to see my latest mixed media paintings. Um, these, uh, when I was spending time focusing mostly on the, the 3D work with the feltanicals, then I had to swing back and just really focus on the 2D. Um, this is, uh, I guess, basically, you know, where my, I mean, 2D is my, is my more inner work, my, my personal emotional landscape work, right? So um, I've kind of flirted with it before, but this was an opportunity for me to really kind of dig in and, um, and really convey that, um, that, that place where I am reconnected by nature, that place where I desire to connect with others, basically that, um, that place that where I'm processing this time and place as a human. Um, so my intention with these paintings um, is that they'll speak more on that intuitive level and perhaps say what my words cannot say. So um, after the crawl, in a couple of weeks, I'll be getting back at it in the studio and I'll be bringing the 3D and the 2D back together again. Um, uh, I guess, yeah, I'll really be using what I've learned in these last two explorations and I have, don't know exactly what it's gonna look like, but I'm excited. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to, to leave, that, leave you with um, just the fact that I do believe us as humans, uh, we, how we care for the environment and how we care and value our emotional landscape, they're linked. You know, they both sustain us. One is outside, one is inside, and I believe the health of both is going to determine the future of humanity. <laughs> And now for our final speaker of the evening, we have Toby Barrett of Propeller Design. <coughs> Excuse me. Toby is a partner and designer at Propeller Design, a multidisciplinary art and design studio based in Strathcona. Propeller's work spans a broad range of disciplines from lighting and furniture design to exhibition design and sculpture. Propeller thrives on creative challenges that allow them to blur the boundaries between art and design and combine their love of sculpture with their skills as designers and makers. And this is Propeller's second year participating in the Culture Crawl. Please welcome Toby. Hello. Hi, Ben. You are so <laughs> handsome. And I got to sit beside him all evening. That's a dream come true. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Chris, for having us here tonight. Um, there's a lot of talk about collaboration, and I'm really fortunate. I get to work every day with my two closest friends. We, the three of us met in art school studying sculpture. And uh, <clears throat> when we graduated, we um, pretty quickly decided we should just continue working together. And we started our firm. Um, right off the bat, we knew we wanted to work in art. We wanted to work in design. We wanted to work sometimes in between those things. Um, so I think um, the reason we, we pretty quickly um, started to focus on, on lighting design. It was a place where it's a really kind of challenging, there's a lot of technical issues, so we had to really improve our design chops quickly there. And it also gave us a lot of opportunity to create large um, sculptural pieces as well. So what you're looking at here is um, an early piece that we made called the Dram Chandelier. It's, uh, it's a piece that we're still making right now for clients. Um, it's composed of, it's a spherical, like 36 inch spherical piece composed of 120 vintage drinking glasses that we source from thrift stores and garage sales and that kind of thing. Um, it's, our work has been, in, it's been involved in, in, you know, looking for sustainable methods from, from the beginning. So sometimes that means, uh, 
using you know organic materials or uh, in this case repurposed materials or um, looking for different strategies and ways to try and create things that lean a little less heavily on the earth it's it's a challenge when you're making things um this is this is our mica light um another of our lighting designs uh it's made of s solid walnut and you'll see the lens is there each one has a little led behind so it gives off an ambient light that's similar to like candlelight level of light um, most of our work is modular in design so it can be scaled up to fit a space um, we've made this as large we've made a configuration of this one that's like 17 feet long that was for a show at the vag a couple of years ago um, but we also make smaller ones that fit over you know dining room tables in restaurants and people's homes and that sort of thing uh, this is a an installation shot from the queen elizabeth theater um, most of our work has gone to the states over the years but um, this was the first big commission that we got to do in our own city which is kind of cool when you actually get to meet the people that you're designing for rather than just email them all the time um, <coughs> we worked with proscenium architecture on this design and the brief was to create feature lighting for this beautiful space that didn't overwhelm the space so we came up with these clusters of our sombrio light which is a design that's visually very permeable um, and translucent and has kind of a, a light feeling in the space. Um, this is uh, our, our range series where we've been working for the last few years um, going back to our roots as, sculpt as sculptors and really enjoying, you know, not having to deal with the really tough technical parts of designing lights that have to not fall on people and light up properly <laughs> and pass CSA regulations and all of that. So this is a chance for us to kind of geek out um, and create these hyper-realistic mountainscapes. Um, they come part from our imaginings and part from our um, observations of the natural world. Um, they're one of the more fun things that we get to do in the studio and they've worked they've been really great for us like we've we've had an opportunity to show them in museum shows in new york and in france and currently there's one showing um at the uh, the new canadian high commission in london there's a great bc design show on there right now if anyone gets a chance to go to london before christmas and the um the High Commission has been completely redesigned and it's absolutely beautiful with full of Canadian art and design. It's just worth, when you're in London, take a look. Um, this is a process shot from our most recent commission that just went out the door the other day. Um, we, were, we were commissioned by our, our client, Lululemon, to, they, they have a new store that they're opening up in, in Malibu. Um, in California so they just gave us the brief of do you make a sculptural piece that's inspired by the surfboard so we delved into uh, we, we we delved into um, you know the surf surf culture and the surfboards and whatnot and pretty quickly fell in love with the visual language of vintage surfboards um, the laminations of beautiful hardwoods the the bands of color and zips of color which you don't see here but we ended up using a lot of color in this piece um, so what we did then is we took the different profiles of, of the surfboards and laid the wood up and turned them on the lathe and created these forms. And some as, you know, from 14 to say 28 inches high. And we made 28 of these pieces all together. And uh, right now they're being installed in, in the store and in two big um, sculptural installations. So... That's a little bit of what we do, and I just really thank Rachel for having us here tonight, and thank you for all coming. Okay.